welcome to State of the State. I'm Darlene DeRezzo, and I'm in conversation with Mike Cirillo, a licensed mental health counselor from What's the Rush RI, and Susan Orbin from the Washington County Coalition for Children. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Mike, you've been here before, and most of our viewers may recognize you. For those that are new to the show, say a few words about yourself. Well, I'm a therapist and I work with uh, any number of uh, adolescent males of all ages, uh, very much so with adolescent males. But I'm not here today with the West Rush marijuana conversation. I'm here as a colleague of Susan and our involvement with mental health first aid and mental health first aid courses. Uh, and what these unique, what this unique program can bring uh, to the challenges of helping people get to treatment when they need the treatment. Mm -hmm. And I'm, Susan knows much more about this history than I'll I. I'll have you introduce Susan to our guests. Okay, so Susan is, uh, I, Susan is uh, an LICSW and has been, f since the mid-90s, uh, growing an organization of volunteer people who work on the ground in the trenches with kids. Uh, first with the Washington County Coalition for Children. She formed that uh, and then now as the director of Healthy Bodies, Healthy Minds of Washington County. And that's an organization that uh, between the two of them has been very, very successful getting grants from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services uh, Administration, SAMHSA. And we've, we've, Susan's acquired a tremendous amount of money to address mental health challenges in South County. Uh, in my view, we've led the state into uh, some of these more very exciting programs, and I'm just going to stop now. Okay. Anything you need to add to that? Well, just a couple corrections. One is that uh, my work with the coalition began in 2001, and while I wish our resources were unlimited, um, we have. Uh, definitely received some grant funds, but um, they're not limitless. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, with that, let me explain a little bit about the Washington County Coalition for Children. Mm -hmm. We are the region's uh, child advocacy organization. And Mike, as Mike said, uh, the group began in the mid-90s, and I came to it in 2001 mm -hmm. um, as its coordinator um, and have been uh, working with um, children's service agencies and volunteers in Washington County to really make a difference uh, with our children and address the unmet needs of children in our region. And uh, uh, we had the opportunity uh, to join this unprecedented collaborative effort with the establishment of the Health Equity Zone mm -hmm. in 2015. Uh, healthy Bodies, Healthy Minds, Washington County, and I was tapped to lead that as well because of the other experience. But um, our effort related to mental health first aid in Washington County really began in 2014, shortly after uh, the tragedy in Newtown, funding became available to communities who were interested in rolling out mental health first aid. Mm -hmm. So what's mental health first aid? Oh, I, I want to stop you. Let's just go back to the mid-90s and what brought this coalition together? Like, was there a need? Was something missing in the community? I think it was a real effort to uh, address unmet needs and bring Such a um, service providers together uh, to address gaps in services. And so, 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 uh, so, what so services were were uneven, mm -hmm. and one of the primary needs that was identified early on were uh, the lack of children's mental health services. Mm -hmm. So in Washington County in particular, we are a mental health shortage area. And uh, because of the stigma related to uh, mental health, uh, mental health first aid became a strategy that the coalition identified as one that our uh, community could really benefit from. Mm -hmm. And so when we had this grant opportunity in 2014, the superintendents in Washington County uh, c worked collaboratively to get a grant to begin with youth mental health first aid rollout in the seven school districts in Washington County. And so that's where the work really began. Mm -hmm. And then uh, with some additional grant funds and our partnership with Healthy Bodies, Healthy Minds, we've been able to roll out uh, mental health 
first aid to adults, to veterans, um, to pu um, public safety, uh, fire, EMS, and so forth. Um, so anyway, that's a little bit more about the background and how we began this work. Okay, and, and how did you two meet now? Well, I was on the council in Exeter, okay. and I found myself uh, being invited to the first or the second uh, meeting that she put together in 2002. And so ever since then, I call her the, the Tom Sawyer, the Thomasina Sawyer of, of South County. She can get anyone to paint a fence, mm -hmm. so to speak, and uh, really does a wonderful job with recruiting people who are committed to working with uh, young people. And mm -hmm. so that's how I got involved with mm -hmm. the coalition. So why do you think the need for mental health services? You know, what, what might be, what's happening in the community, the children, the adolescents there? Well, the data really um, speaks volumes about uh, what the needs of our community are and um, in terms of children, uh, showing up in our emergency rooms, uh, ne needing services, um, the, um, the number of, of school professionals talking about the, the needs of students and it interfering with their school performance. Um, and uh, the coalition was really interested in what could we do um, to really work upstream. Um, it became pretty evident that we're not going to um, uh, intervene our way out of this problem and that uh, really we need to um, focus on prevention and identify children earlier mm -hmm. before they ever get to an emergency room and that's the beauty of mental health first aid so mental health first aid was really the um, the brainstorm of Betty Kitchener and Anthony Jorm from Australia, who in 2001 uh, decided that we needed something comparable to a CPR um, and, and put their minds together to create this curriculum to teach everyone common signs and symptoms of mental health disorders and give them the confidence to be able to ask questions and get involved and identify um, youth and other adults, neighbors, family members that might be struggling and then know what to do in helping them get hooked up with services. And so it started in 2001 in Australia and it's become an international movement. It came to the United States in 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, and Rhode Island was one of the first states to help begin implementing it. But no one has taken on this kind of community-wide approach like we have in Washington. Washington County and we're just thrilled about that and so it was you know it was quite natural having worked with Mike that when we had this grant opportunity come to us he was one of the first people I called and said I want you to become an instructor for me mm. um, and uh, he's really been he's trained more people in mental health first aid than any of our other instructors in Washington County mm -hmm. um, and he's really um, leading the effort in organizing trainings locally yeah so I just want to kind of get under though so there's this need right and over the years we've seen a, a growing concern for children and adolescent mental health so why is that you know, what's yeah. kind of at the root of this so, increasing yeah. mental health issues for this population? So the critical thing about mental health first aid, whether it's the youth mental health first aid model or the adult, is that it takes an awfully long time, median number of years from diagnosis or recognition that there's a significant problem. The median number of years in the United States is 10 years before people engage with treatment. And in addition to unique problems in South County like uh, availability of services, the, the fundamental issues, the barriers to treatment, at, uh, uh, engaging in treatment are stigma, mm -hmm. fear of the unknown on the part of both the individual who may be experiencing the, the emotional challenge and the person who first encounters it or is encountering it. 
And then the last uh, barrier is lack of information. And that's what mental health first aid is about. It helps people who are in non-clinical roles, everyday roles, uh, they, they are able to develop a well-informed, non-judgmental relationship with an individual and help defuse the stigma, both in, in, in the individual case and in the environment. Uh, and when that stigma is overcome or, or mod moderated, it makes it much more uh, comfortable for them to seek help. Uh, so that's the genius of this program. Uh, people spend eight hours, and when they finish, they've got a certificate that is essentially about developing well-informed relationships uh, with people who may be having the challenge. We know that 75% of mental health challenges and in, in, in illnesses across all uh, conditions, anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia, substance abuse, co-occurring, lots of co-occurring substance abuse with many of the conditions. We know that 75% of those, those uh, uh, cases, those diagnoses are gonna take place in the first 25 years of life. Mm -hmm many of them starting in adolescence. In childhood, and I would even say. And of course, well, seven years old. Mm -hmm. Just in 10 years, our numbers have gone, uh, the median age of onset for anxiety conditions have gone from 12 to seven, based on the substantial research behind the Mental Health First Aid Program. Mm -hmm. that's, that's huge. So if we can, why? So, so if we again, can, I'm asking why. But if, but if we can intervene early, we can change people's lifelong trajectories. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the beauty of mental health first aid. So when you ask why, what we do in the, in the mental health first aid is help people recognize both the risk factors and the protective factors uh, that can be helpful uh, it, to understand. We, we can know from things like uh, whether or not a person has high self-esteem or an environment that's supportive, they're going to be less likely, especially in their younger days, to experience those uh, challenges at an intense level. Mm -hmm. But when you take, for example, anxiety, uh, and you start looking at some risk factors there, well, Today, someone who's in sixth grade or fifth grade, uh, is, or even younger, uh, they've grown up in a post-911 world, okay? They've grown up in a world where there are school shootings. Mm -hmm. as, as Susan mentioned, you know, this emerged in many ways out of the, the uh, uh, Newtown disaster. And of course, they live in a, in a world of terrorism. So young people are being uh, raised in an environment where they've got to do active shooter drills. Uh, that's an anxiety-provoking thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so are social media issues uh, 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 that, that uh, young people have, you know? Have I enough friends? Well, why did I get unfriended? Those kinds of things can be very anxiety-provoking. Now. Does that mean that there's some underlying biogenetic condition? Perhaps. It may also be a situational thing. Either way, the way in which teachers, janitors, little league coaches, church school teachers, parents, siblings, uh, the way they interact with that can make a huge difference in addressing the problem, ad helping that child understand that uh, and, and, and overcome the fear or the anxiety that is produced by feeling anxious. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know whether that answers your question about mm -hmm. why. Uh, that's an example with respect to anxiety. We know that marijuana today really creates a problem in mental illness in areas like uh, the, the sensitivity that, that conditions like bipolar depression, schizophrenia, uh, PTSD, all of those conditions are very, very marijuana sensitive. In some cases, they can actually be caused by it. Mm -hmm. So co-occurring substance use is a major reason this happens. And even young, young kids are part of that uh, uh, vulnerability, very young kids, in terms of uh, how frequently they're using very high potency pot mm -hmm. and its impact on mental illness. 
So those are some of the whys um, that, that school, schools are experiencing with young people. And colleges and universities are experiencing with uh, people in that you know, 18 to 25 year range. We've been thrilled that URI has partnered with us and rolled out mental health first aid on their campus. So and so for the last two years, they've made sure that they've started the year by training all of their residents' life staff mm -hmm. in mental health first aid, which is incredible. Right, that's, I, that's what I was gonna ask. So the training is going to who first? Okay, so residential staff, instructors, professors, and you're seeing teachers, coaches. Right, vet people who serve veterans. Mm -hmm. Veterans are a huge need. We're rolling out the veterans program in Rhode Island uh, for veterans, uh, uh, active duty service personnel, and most importantly, their families. You know, the, in Rhode Island, well, nationally we know uh, that, that there are about 22 people in, in the veterans military world who are succumbing to suicide every single day. And one of the, one of the uh, really startling facts about that is only about 20, 25% at the most have act, of those individuals who have died have actually accessed VA services. And that's not the VA's fault. They're trying to get them to come in. But again, it's stigma. Mm -hmm. It's fear. Uh, when I get a, when a, by the time a veteran shows up in my office, things are really critical. They've very seldom ap approached VA, and they really want me to guarantee that I'm not going to tell VA or their military command mm -hmm. that they're there for PTSD or for relationship problems or for substance use problems or because they, I had one man uh, come into my office not so long ago who said, if I, have, if, if I didn't have my dog to take care of, I wouldn't be sitting here mm -hmm. because of the isolation and uh, the stigma that he was experiencing as a military man mm -hmm. whose relationships had fallen apart as a result of PTSD. Mm -hmm. So mental health first aid has any number of ways of supporting individuals with uh, lived experiences that perhaps many of us can't even imagine are there. Mm -hmm. uh, our, our teams are all people who have lived experience in these various areas and clinicians who have lived experiences in those areas. Many people don't realize is that one in five of us has a diagnosable mental health disorder. Mm -hmm. And so it's one in five of our friends, our neighbors, and so forth. And so, you know, to get back to your early, earlier question about why, I'm not so sure that, that it's, that more people are out there, it's maybe that we didn't know they were out there, mm -hmm. um, and that um, mental health first aid gives us language to be able to connect with folks. And it helps us dispel myths, and some common myths, I think, um, that are really important, particularly this month, since it's Suicide Prevention Month, and in, let's, in let's relation to, to, um, to what Mike was saying about, about veterans, mm -hmm. but others, is the fact that, um, I think one of the myths that we um, don't realize is that many people think that suicide can't be prevented. If it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And in fact, suicide is the most preventable death there is. Uh, and so there is much that can be done in offering hope to someone mm -hmm. and, and helping co connect but them with the resources. Audience. And okay. also, the most important thing we can do is to raise the question and ask someone, are you thinking of suicide? Mm -hmm. Just by opening the conversation and allowing someone to share their thoughts and feelings, you know, we often think that we're gonna put the idea in somebody's head. Mm -hmm. and. And that's not the case at all. And so opening up that conversation is really vital also. So there's two misconceptions. One is that it's not preventable, and one is that we're gonna put the thought in someone else's idea. Any other misconceptions? That it, uh, there, there are special populations that, you know, there, there are um, different socioeconomic groups that are more vulnerable. That is not the case. This is an equal opportunity 
evil. Okay, suicide's out there trying to get a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, and it doesn't matter how much money they have, it doesn't matter what their ethnic backgrounds are, or it doesn't matter what their ages are. They're all vulnerable to one degree or another. That's a huge myth that, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, it can't happen in my backyard, it can't mm -hmm. happen in my family. Mm -hmm. And some, some of the most vulnerable among us are doctors are EMS folks, right. are people that are on the front lines, people that are protecting us, that are on the front lines of tragedy every day. Mm -hmm. um, and right. uh, they're yeah. the ones that, that we don't often think of are right. at risk for suicide. So I just want to let you know we have ten, ten minutes. Ah. Okay, so wow. we just want to make sure we're taking this in a direction that's mm. going to cover everything. Uh, okay. <laughs> this is an eight-hour course. <laughs> We're trying to summarize. But no, right, uh, right. ten minutes is a lot. There right. are a lot of people who don't consider things like this mm -hmm. for more than a minute because of the denial, because of the stigma. Uh, you know, in Rhode Island, we really are getting better at managing suicide. Our rates have gone down. Nationally, there are 123 deaths by suicide a day. In Rhode Island, it's one death every three days. So there are promising things that the Department of Health has been able to do with prevention and education, and they're partners with us mm -hmm. in some of these mental health first aid trainings. One of the most tragic things about suicide is that there's a ripple effect. Well, we know from research that every time someone dies by suicide, there are 135 people affected by it. And, in, and it's in various ways uh, that, that they're affected by it. Uh, I, think that, uh, I think that if we recognize that suicide is a character in their lives, pretty much in everyone's life, it could try to get us. Uh, during a relationship breakout, a breakup, that's a big risk factor for it. Uh, uh, when we've uh, lubricated our impulse control system to the point it has no control uh, with substances, that can be something that can, can partner with suicide to get us or to try to get someone. Um, I, I think that uh, when you consider that it's the second leading cause of death in Rhode Island for 15 to 34 year olds, it's the fourth leading cause of death for 35 to 54 year olds, and the eighth leading cause of death for 55 to 64 year olds. Mm -hmm. That's a lot yeah, of, and can of you, vulnerability. Can you break down those ages into um, men, women? Uh, well, men, men are, uh, are much more likely to die by suicide mm -hmm. than women but women have a much higher rate of attempting suicide. Uh, and that's because men tend to use more lethal means. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting, we, we learned uh, that in rural areas, the risks are much higher because of isolation, because of more ready availability to firearms, uh, for winding roads with lots of trees on it. One of the most common things when I ask the question, are you thinking of killing yourself and I get a yes and then they say I say to them well what kind of how would what what were you thinking about doing I get guys all the time telling me I'm going to drive you know I think I'm going to you know drive into a tree or a bridge abutment very common uh, uh, possibility in their minds mm -hmm. um, I I think that when we look at if you want to break down some numbers we know in Rhode Island that 16% of high school students seri seriously consider it, and 14% have made a plan, and 11% have attempted annually. That's very current numbers. That's 2017 surveys. Mm -hmm. And the numbers for middle school are just as startling. Mm -hmm. So with that, I think it's really important to share some important resource information. So the National Suicide Prevention Line is 1-800-273-8255 or 273-TALK. Um, 
Um, there's also a text uh, line, a crisis text line, which is simply 741741 and, and start texting your questions and, and you'll get an immediate response. Mm -hmm. Also, the Samaritans of Rhode Island um, also offer a hotline that's answered 24 hours and that number is 272. 4044, area code 401. Um, so those are some important resources. I think another wonderful website um, for people um, is nowmattersnow.org. Mm -hmm. um, so. And one of the most helpful resources, if you can help someone seek, you know, seek some support, is their primary care doc. It's perhaps the most trusted relationship they have. It's not stigmatizing for them to walk into their doctor's office. Mm -hmm. And today, well, in Washington County, we do uh, support the pediatric community with mental health first aid, with mental health uh, updates on, on current, material, current materials and, and research in the mental health world. Uh, that's something that everyone can do. Uh, they can encourage someone to go see their doc and talk about mm -hmm. it with their primary care doc. Uh, very often the primary care practices today have very close relationships and even embedded mental health professionals mm -hmm. there. No, it's, it's also important for um, a physician to rule out any underlying medical issue that might affect mood. So it's very important to uh, check yeah, in with your Very, very important. PCP. And train and the, the mental health, uh, the, the that's a program we have in South County now. We haven't talked about zero suicide, right? No, we haven't. So Dr. Harrison, Dr. Rob Harrison, who's a retired uh, ER doc, has, is responsible for another grant, five-year, two-and-a-half million dollar grant, to train uh, docs in how to screen beyond the physical. Mm -hmm. Okay, for example, veterans. Uh, we know that, and, and uh, they often go into a doc complaining about physical things, but the docs haven't been as aware as they're becoming. So the zero s about mental health challenges, so they're starting to ask those questions. So the program that Dr. Harrison is spearheading for us down there is to train emergency room staff to, to, to screen everyone that comes into the, to the hospital and then to take those at risk and make sure they get treatment, mm -hmm. they get referrals to mental health s services. And the same is true in terms of the physicians themselves. Mm -hmm. And we're rolling that out not only in emergency rooms, but in eight healthcare organizations across Washington County with the goal of zero suicide. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are also doing um, training with primary care doctors um, around um, pediatric behavioral health um, concerns uh, through monthly trainings for them as well, another Washington County Coalition project. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. we're doing a lot to try to increase the skill of our workforce um, and to increase the comfort of residents in Washington County in being able to talk about and address mental health needs in our community. We're down to a minute. We have to wrap it up. You want to tell our audience where to find you on social media or the web? So people can go to the uh, bodiesminds.org website to find out information about our upcoming mental health first aid courses. Um, and I would encourage anyone to take the time to take a mental health first aid course and become certified. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, reaching out, asking the question, the uh, contacting me, I'm happy to talk with someone about it whenever that arises. Talk to the schools that now we've trained well over 700, maybe 800 uh, school staff. So every school in South County knows about it. And what's really exciting is that the State Department of Education has just acquired a two and a half million dollar grant. And they are training. I am going to have you come back to talk about that. I don't mean to cut you short, <laughs> but we have to wrap up. I'm Darlene DeRezzo. Thanks for watching. Remember, you can find us at our new Instagram account. It's State of the State RI. Thanks.